Our theme today is advocating, advocating for social justice. And if you would allow me within the time allotted, I would like to look at that theme from two different uh, 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 complementary perspectives. I call it the external and internal uh, advocacy. And um, we have seen in recent weeks down in the state of Florida in the wake of the Trayvon Martin tragedy, the inspiring results of effective external advocacy, advocacy out in the community, out in the streets, out in the halls of government to bring about social justice. Pressure from committed activists pushed the governor of Florida to appoint a special prosecutor who moved swiftly with an indictment and also pushed the governor to impanel a task force which is even now evaluating the controversial, I say dangerous, stand your ground law under which citizens are empowered to use deadly force when they perceive themselves to be in peril. These developments are a direct result of advocacy by community activists and organizations that are dedicated to social justice, organizations like the NAACP. And they, these developments are reminders too that unified, strategic, and appropriate action can and will move the powers that be. Now, the environment is different. It's better here, I think, in our local community of Altadena and Pasadena. At this time in history, we are fortunate to have partners, friends in law enforcement and in government at the local, state, and national level who have shown through their activities over the years their willingness to cooperate with organizations like the NAACP as they advocate for social justice. So we are operating in a different climate than exists in other parts of the country, other parts of our state, other parts of our county. The devastating loss of Kendrick McDade differs dramatically from the Trayvon Martin tragedy, uh, both in the response of local officials and also in the substance of the tragedy, the actual circumstances of the, of the shooting. In one case, what we had was an example of the worst kind of racial profiling carried to the farthest extreme by an overzealous civilian who had no authority to do anything that he did. In the other case, we have a tragic outcome of a circumstance wherein law enforcement professionals operating under the best information, official information available to them at that time, were forced to make a terrible split second life and death situation, uh, decision under circumstances that could legitimately have been, from their perspective, regarded as a life-threatening circumstance. Speaking of the response of local officials, we have been uh, watching over the recent weeks as our local police chief, Philip Sanchez, has extended himself through meetings with local activists, ministers, participating in community forums and appearing in the local media. The chief has also, he was the one who initiated the investigation by the Office of Independent Review. So what we have again is an opportunity for cooperative effort as opposed to advocacy against hostile authorities. So this cooperation between government, law enforcement, in our community here in Altadena, Pasadena, contrast to what we've seen in Sanford, Florida, and even as close as the city of Los Angeles, deeply troubling are the allegations of indifference to uh, claims of excessive force, uh, allegations against Los Angeles Police Chief Charlie Beck, who was accused of being indifferent toward claims of excessive force by members of his department. Even more disturbing, uh, the accusations, the allegations of misconduct involving our L.A. County Sheriff's deputies, uh, whether it be the uh, reports of systematic physical abuse within the Men's Central Jail, and these shocking claims of gang-like activity by officers who've given their groups names like the 3,000 Boys and the, the Jump Off Boys. So the advocacy for justice is something that continues. And it is right, of course, for us to advocate as we look at matters involving law enforcement. But we also know that many more of our 
people, particularly our young African-American and Latino men, many more lives are shattered, many more families shattered because of street crime. As concerned as we are about making certain that law enforcement interacts with the community in a just way, our outrage, our sense of commitment to justice must be just as fervent when we address what's happening as a result of gang activity. And that brings us to what I call our internal advocacy. It's been quite encouraging to hear so many speakers talk today about the work going on within internally, within our community, in the form of mentoring and educational activism. Because this is a crucial component to not only advocating for justice, but to literally saving the lives of our young people and our communities. Uh, I believe it was uh, Congresswoman Chu who a moment ago reminded us that it is not only law enforcement's duty, but America's duty to see to it that there are no more Trayvon Martins. And that process begins not only in how we look at police community interaction, but it also involves what we do with our young people and talking to them about how they conduct themselves in the classroom and in the community. Because, because what we have to do is we have to get our young people prepared to be successful, not only in career, but more importantly in life, successful character. And so the speakers we've heard today and the organizations and programs that we've heard about that are nurturing, whether it be Act So or, or Brother Tecumseh's mentoring or, or any of the other things we've heard about today, these are the kinds of things that we must continue to do with, 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 with boldness, with commitment, with passion, with undying love. We've got to uh, continue to fight for quality education and education funding. Working with our school officials, working with our elected officials to do something different with these budgets. To find additional sources, resources. It was mentioned that I was a PTA president and it was uh, just when we go and your parents, you understand what I'm talking about. You go to meetings and all we hear is bad news about how there's no money. And we see the dedication of classroom teachers and principals and school board people. And, and I just want to encourage all of us to stay the course. It's rough out there, but we are not going to stand by and allow a generation of ours to be lost because somebody told us there's no money to educate them. We're not going to do that. And this is where organizations like the NAACP and the black community in general, this is one of the areas where we shine as an example to progressive people worldwide. Because we're the folks from whom everything was taken centuries ago. And we found a way to make the proverbial way out of no way. What? Stony the road we trod. What? No such word is impossible in our history. And that is part of the message that we got to give the young brothers and sisters so they know how important it is to do their best with the opportunities in front of them.
We have got to work deliberately and boldly to dismantle the counterproductive, socially corrosive beliefs and attitudes which cause far too many of our young people to fall short of their God-given potential. See, we have to boldly promote the truth, the truth that getting good grades, and working hard in school, being educated, being an upright citizen, these are not the qualities of a sellout. No, 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 no. We've got to promote the truth that intelligence, academic excellence, good citizenship, these are the keys to, this, to success. And they are the distinguishing characteristics of great men and women who laid the foundation for us. Indeed, these are the qualities of kings and queens. And this is what we've got to empower our young people to know. We have got to carve out, as if it were cancer, this long-standing lie that black and Latino young people are not supposed to be smart. I heard it when I was at Elliott. I heard it when I was at Muir. And some of our young people are still hearing it. How tragic it is. We've got black and brown kids walking around with the genius intelligence put in them by the creator and they're ashamed to let the world know about it. Don't want to be seen with a textbook. Don't want to discuss current affairs and intellectual concepts because somebody who looks like them is gonna make them feel bad about it. That is a cancer. Somebody lied to us. Somebody lied to us a long time ago and the lie was so well told and so convincing that some of us internalized it. And we started telling it to each other. And we have young black and brown men and women walking around in confusion, don't even know, don't even realize that they are the direct descendants of the people who built the pyramids. They don't understand. So we've got to let them know. We've got to empower them and remind them all the time that down through the ages, our people have always been smart, intellectual, professional, effective, accomplished <laughs> builders. We have always participated in every level of society. As I say, we are the descendants of those people who built the pyramids, some of the oldest, most powerful effigies, thousands of years old, standing as strong as they did as if they were built yesterday. We've got to let our young people know when they're worried about, you know, am I supposed to be intellectual, say, son, daughter, let me tell you what, don't you know you are the descendant of the scholars of Timbuktu? and of Cordoba, and if you don't know what those cities are, sit down, I'll open the book and I hope you know about it, because when you know, you'll feel proud. All the Aztecs, the Toltecs, the Mayas, they were some of the greatest mathematicians and astronomers on Earth, and our young people, when they know this, will understand that it is their legacy, it is their destiny to carry on that legacy. And so when we talk about advocating for social justice, let us continue to remind our young people that they were born for greatness, that the creator of the very universe placed in each one of us a divine spark, some talent, intellect, aptitude, a unique, beautiful, and wonderful energy that each of us is to use, to develop, and then use for the betterment of all humankind. This is the destiny for which we were born. And we've seen young people today demonstrate to us and remind us again what commitment and love and passion and hard work will yield. And that is why we can always know that our advocacy will lead not only to justice, but to a glorious, continually expanding future in which we look forward to more successes than failures. Times can seem bleak, but our being here today reminds us of how much power we have and how much talent we share and how strong commitment is. And if we just use what we've been given and continue the course
continue the work that this branch and Pasadena and all of the NAACP organizations and truly all progressive groups, I don't mean progressive politically necessarily, I mean about progress. Individuals and organizations who are trying to make this a better world, stay the course. Don't be discouraged. We're gonna keep working because a man we all admire said a whole number of years ago that he was confident that we as a people were gonna get to the promised land. And it's looking kind of promised around here. I never stop believing in promises because as Mother Maya said, each one of us is the hope and the dream of the slave. I'm Cameron Turner. Thank you for listening. That's my two cents. My privilege to be with you today and I thank you.